our Ocean Acidification Harmful Algal Bloom webinar series. My name is Erica Hudson from NOAA's Ocean Acidification Program, and I'll be moderating the webinar today. Jennifer Mintz from NOAA's Ocean Acidification Program will be our producer working behind the scenes to keep Adobe Connect going. If you have any problems with Adobe Connect, please enter it in the chat box in the upper right corner of your screen, and we'll work to address those. Thanks for joining us today for our modeling and forecasting ocean acidification and harmful algal blooms to meet stakeholders' needs, regional perspectives. This talk will be different than our other webinars in this series as we have four speakers and a slightly longer session. So I hope you can all join us um, for an hour and a half today as our talks will be ending and the discussion will just be starting at the end of the hour. This series is set to lay the foundation for a virtual workshop on August 11th to 13th, where we will discuss harmful algal bloom and ocean acidification interactions, the major questions surrounding them, and what research priorities can help address gaps in our understanding and management of these factors. This is number four in a series of webinars to prepare for this workshop. The workshop will help us to identify priorities and research products that can be incorporated into a future request for proposals on the intersection of harmful algal blooms and ocean acidification. If you're not yet signed up for that workshop but would like to participate, please contact Maya Sharp, whose email is in the chat box. Now I'm going to turn it over to Maya to introduce herself and share a little bit about her summer project with us. Hello and good day, everyone. I am Maya Sharp, a NOAA Educational Partnership Program undergraduate scholar. And I will be completing a project based on the webinar's content, questions, and discussions. The chat box will be monitored and recorded during the webinar. And there will also be a questionnaire that we will use to inform our workshop and future decisions of research funding. Those accessing the webinar online will have the opportunity to comment and ask questions through the Google form. And the link will be in the chat box for discussion at the workshop. I will then compile these and synthesize them for our workshop. Hello all. Thank you, Maya. This is Jen and just want to take a few moments to help get oriented for those that may be new to the Adobe Connect platform. Audio is over the computer. You can listen through your computer speakers or headphones. If you're having trouble hearing, you may either turn up your volume on your computer speaker or headset. You may also turn up the volume in Adobe Connect. So in the top menu bar showed here, you can click the pull-down arrow to the right of the speaker icon and select Adjust Speaker Volume. If you're on a headset, go to the speaker icon, hit that pull-down, and select Speaker to find the headset you are listening on. If you are still having trouble hearing, please log off and log back on and enter using the Adobe Connect application rather than entering through the browser. As we step into our presentations today, you are welcome to view the presentation in full screen. And you will do that by toggling um, the, this icon, the four arrow icon in the upper right edge of the slides. You will lose chat and captioning boxes if you do go into full screen, but can toggle back to regular view at any time to ask questions or add comments to the chat box. We do ask that you enter your questions, and please note who it is directed to, as we do have four speakers today, in the chat box at any time. We'll hold questions till the end of the presentation. And also note that in the chat box, we'll be sharing any relevant um, links that are mentioned. And of course, the questionnaire that Maya mentioned will also be displayed in the chat box. At the end of the presentation, we do hope that we will have a discussion and open it up for questions. If you'd like to comment but are not the questioner, please go ahead and raise your hand by clicking on the icon highlighted here, and we will go ahead and unmute you. We will post a recording and a PDF of the slides on our workshop webpage. The address will be in the chat box momentarily. And a link to the questionnaire that Maya has mentioned will also be available on the website, where you can send follow-up questions and comments after the webinar. 
We really encourage you to fill out this questionnaire. We're using the responses to inform our discussion at the workshop and our directions for future research. So with that, I'll hand it back to you, Erica. All right, we have a, a great lineup for you guys today. Today we have four speakers, Samantha Sedlecki from the University of Connecticut, Clarissa Anderson from the Southern California Ocean Observing System, Jan Newton from the Northwest Association of Networked Ocean Observing Systems, and Barb Kirkpatrick from the Gulf of Mexico Coastal Ocean Observing System. We're going to start it off with Samantha Sedlecki, who focuses on coastal regions where she implements numerical simulations to investigate and identify processes within that environment responsible for biogeochemical dynamics in both the modern and future, future oceans. She received her PhD from the University of Chicago, where she focused on theoretical systems of the ocean. And as a postdoc at the University of Washington, she began simulating Washington and Oregon waters using realistic simulations of ocean acidification variables and hypoxia developed as part of the coastal modeling group there. She's extended that work to include seasonal using JSCOPE and short-term through live ocean forecasts. And now, an, as an assistant professor at the University of Connecticut, she's begun exploring regional climate projections of ocean conditions on both the west and east coast of the U.S. Through work with colleagues on the west coast, as well as new collaborators as part of the Early Career Faculty Innovators Program at NCAR, she is partnering with social scientists to bring these tools into decision-making frameworks. All right. Great. Thank you so much um, for having me, uh, inviting me to talk to you today. I'm really excited to tell you about um, some ocean acidification uh, variable forecasts that exist in the, um, around the large marine systems of, of the U.S. Um, the, just as a side note, like a lot of, of uh, regional oceanographers, the modelers contributed um, slides to this talk, and um, I wasn't able to include all of them in my 15 minutes, so I, um, I do have them all in the slide deck, however, and so um, I'm, the slides will be available um, within the next few days, I'm told, um, post-webinar, and so if you're looking for a modeler near you, uh, you can use the, these slides as a reference um, uh, to, that, to that end. Okay, so um, um, also we'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, so there's going to be a poll that's opening soon, if not already. Um, to, to inquire basically like what, what do you want or need in order um, from a forecast system in order to adequately simulate interactions between ocean acidification and HABs. So what, what do you want or need um, to simulate these interactions? Um, and we'll come back to this, uh, the answers to this poll from the audience during the discussion. Okay, so the key questions when I was asked to talk, uh, these are some thoughts that came to my mind, and um, they're going to kind of guide the talk from here on out. And so um, first, to think about kind of what habitats are key to forecast for HABs, and you know, these are going to be regionally specific and species specific, and um, I'm going to discuss a little bit what our current capability for ocean acidification variable forecasting is, which is quite extensive. Um, how we're, I'll talk about how good is good enough in terms of forecast skill. Um, I'll, we'll talk a little bit about how uncertainty is currently conveyed, and, and, and I would love to hear about ways we can do better. We can always do better at this. And then uh, kind of what thoughts on end with some thoughts on what we need to, to properly support and simulate this interaction. So when thinking about um, simulating, uh, simulating ocean acidification and HAB interactions, one thing to consider is kind of where are the ocean acidification forecasts adequate in order to support these HAB forecasts. You know, so basically this, these biotoxins can be transferred throughout the food web as we've heard in the prior webinars in this series um, and then it's well known. And so here's a figure here from uh, Berdelet et al. in 2015 just kind of as an example of one kind of HAB where these pelagic um, you know, surface-dwelling organisms, the dinoflagellates, right, um, are consumed by an apertrophic level, and then again another apertrophic level. But each of those, um, each of those interactions is, exists in a different habitat or area of the environment. So 
Um, the, the shellfish that consume the dinoflagellates, for example, can be found in benthic environments and sometimes even intertidal, which would, um, would be you know, a certain area that we would need to ensure that the ocean acidification variables were, were, were well stimulated. So we can't solely think about the surface in these problems, right? And then, of course, that interaction where, um, where the pelagic fish, you know, small fin fish and, or large carnivores even, would be um, consuming smaller organisms or some of these shellfish in order at, and that trophic transfer would occur. And so this, um, the second, the higher trophic levels may require upper trophic level ecosystem simulations or other avenues, you know, to include that capability. Um, but not all uh, halves reside at the surface all the time. So here's an example from the Gulf of Maine where um, a certain type of uh, hab it, it, it ha has a benthic cyst, these Alexandrium catinella, um, experience benthic cysts at one point of their life stage. So the habitat at all of the life stages of the hab, um, particularly at the decision point that we're trying to support, is important to consider when developing these forecast systems. Um, and those things are going to be, considerations are going to be regionally and species specific. And as what has been pointed out also before in these prior webinars by um, Chris Goldberg in particular, right, is that this ocean acidification is a multi-stressor um, and can be, um, you know, in the sense that um, it could be CO2 that is stressing the organism or it could be pH. Um, and so here's two examples of that, like one where uh, CO2 levels are important um, for, uh, you know, the carbon concentrating mechanism, the uh, Rubisco, um, and that's part of the, the pathway that people think is important for the HAB development. Um, or in the case of demoic acid production from foo et al., that was more pH, right? And so as a modeler, then we have to be a, build a flexible system um, that is able to um, to both produce CO2 or pH forecast. And so just as an example of that, um, in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, you know, Fabian Gomez has a paper that just came out in 2020. A, a lot of models nowadays are built to be flexible like that, to have uh, the ability um, to, uh, to solve the equ equations for the carbonate system and produce fields that are either saturation state, pH, or PCO2. Um, and so uh, one such system is this one that was, that was developed by Fabian Gomez for the Gulf of Mexico. Another is one that has just recently uh, been funded by Ocean Acidification Program, um, led by uh, Dr. Lee Jin from uh, Corpus Christi, and uh, Rob Hetland. This is a figure of, of a model that Rob um, has from his website of initial drifter depth. And that model has been used to forecast um, various uh, things, but not yet ocean acidification. Um, so we're just on the edge there. So kind of what in thinking about our current capabilities then for ocean acidification forecasting around the U.S., um, you can see that uh, we have there's quite a few short-term forecasts. So um, on the time scale of a few days that are currently being ported um, through uh, through regional. IUS portals, and so Live Ocean is an example I'll talk about from the Pacific Northwest that's, port, that's ported through NANUS. Um, Miracus has uh, one that's in Chesapeake Bay, which I'll also show you. Uh, Nikos is ported through Nirakus, and that one, um, is, while it currently has ocean fields, the um, ocean acidification fields are, um, are on their way in the next couple of years. And so these systems are available. So kind of focusing then on one in particular, this is the Chesapeake Bay Environmental Forecast System. Um, Margie Friedrichs was kind enough to share some slides. Um, and so you can find out more about this at the website there on the bottom. Um, but they are forecasting, in again, that flexible way, the bottom pH or saturation state. Um, and these forecasts are going all the way into these inlets here. So like zooming in on that purple box on the right, you can see that they're providing information right up to the into these uh, these small uh, these small coastal embayments. Um, there's also a seasonal forecast. So not only are these forecasts available on short time scales and time scales of days, but we're also able to extend these ocean forecasts to seasonal time scales. And one example here is that in the Bering Sea, um, there's a, a ROMS model that's been 
used there to um, forecast the cold pool um, and is provided through to the ecosystem status report in the region um, for some time. And it is currently being adapted to include ocean acidification, which is the project being led by Darren Pilcher, Jessica Croft, and Al Harmon. Um, and so uh, stay tuned for more results there. We also are looking to extend our, our predictive capabilities to decadal timescales. Um, and so uh, this is a, from a recent paper um, uh, by Brady et al., uh, Nature Communications, out of Nikki Lewandowski's group. Um, and so you can see that they found this. Um, so this top panel here is anomaly correlation coefficient, um, a common uh, measure of, of predictive skill. And so the higher it is, the better it is. You want it to be as close to one as possible. Um, and so what you can see here is that over time, which is on the x-axis in terms of years, um, for uh, pH, we lose our predictive skill um, over, that, over that time, uh, many years out into the future. So we're not quite there yet on decadal timescales, but certainly there for multiple years in advance for surface pH in the California current. Um, so lots of work going on in that capacity as well. So how good is good enough in terms of skill um, for forecasting? And for that, I'm going to use an example um, uh, from led by Parker McCready um, and, uh, that I worked on for years. Um, still continue to work with Parker on this, which is a live ocean uh, short-term forecast that's supported through regional uh, NANUS um, IOS portal, funded by the Ocean Acidification Center, um, and uh, this forecast is. Um, uh, we, we've ensured that there's a lot of um, there's a lot of uh, model evaluation that's available on the web, and so um, what you can see here on the left are like particular points that you can click on on the web from this website that's located here. But you can also do this through the NANUS portal um, and look and see compare the forecast directly to the observations at various depths. Um, and, and within the regions that the stakeholders are interested. So for example, one region of interest is Willapa Bay here. And um, so the forecast uh, is high, high enough resolution um, that goes and, and includes freshwater forcings, which are really important in the region. Um, and so you can see that influence of that freshwater um, uh, from the Columbia River plume here around 46.2 latitude uh, coming out onto the outer coast. Um, on the bottom aragonite, saturate, aragonite saturation state and the surface on the right, um, and getting kind of swept into Willapa Bay over time. And so um, without this kind of trust building um, ex endeavor, where we actually have the model evaluation available all the time, it's, uh, it's hard to, to bring stakeholders in and, and um, kind of build those rapports and help them to use these tools. So on the East Coast, there, there's a different kind of observational assets that are being brought in um, through a, a recently funded work um, led by Grace Saba at Rutgers, um, where uh, they're going to be using gliders to really get at that subsurface variability and bringing in that into a calibrating a regional ecosystem um, and biogeochemical model in the Mid-Atlantic Bight. So, you know, how is uncertainty currently conveyed? It's important to really think about uncertainty when we're putting these forecasts out there um, and thinking about their utility. And so uh, for that, I'll rely on an example from a project that I led um, that I continue to lead um, called JScope, uh, which is a seasonal forecast system. You can find out more about it on the website, which is available through the NANUS portal. We've been forecasting since 2013. Um, our first forecast was, was uh, put on the web in January of 2013. Um, and a couple of years later, we, we started to include uh, ocean acidification variables like pH and saturation state. Um, and so you can check those out. Um, and those forecasts are used to support a, a variety of different habitat forecasts as well um, that are all delivered to the Pacific Fishery Management Council each spring. So kind of just as an example of of a, um, one, one uh, example of model evaluation that we did was left, you can see a five-month forecast of the depth of the saturation horizon, so a different measure. And, um, and then on the right were the observations from that cruise in 2016 um, showing you where uh, in the water column that, that saturation horizon resides. 
Um, and these workouts were used for cruise planning, and, and our, we're, we're attempting to do that again now. <laughs> um, okay, so, but, you know, we, we also put our uncertainty, a measure of uncertainty out there. There's a variety of different measures of uncertainty, um, but one of them is, uh, comes from uh, that, the fact that we use a mini ensemble. And so our mini ensemble of forecasts um, provides us with a, a measure of uh, a percent agreement, essentially. So uh, here we're looking at maps of, of that uncertainty for sea surface temperature from a particular forecast. And so um, and you can see more of these kinds of, uh, of visualizations on the website. But um, you know, low uncertainty is in the lighter colors, and darker uncertainty is in the, high, in the deeper blue hues. Just to give an idea about where in the region we have we um, experience more uncertainty um, in our forecast, where the ensemble members agree less. So, um, kind of forward thinking, what do we need to do in order to simulate um, and properly support kind of ocean acidification and, and have forecasting efforts? And for that, I'd like to highlight a recent paper that Fei Chai um, just had come out. Um, and was kind enough to send along for it for this, and um, that's the new capabilities that are going to merge with the biogeochemical Argo, uh, BGC Argo, and uh, the data assimilation potential that exists within that pathway, um, which is highlighted in this figure from that paper. Um, so basically, the data assimilation from more more data uh, accumulated by these BGC Argo floats um, and mobile platforms. Um, would be able to be integrated into a data assimilative framework and really help, um, you know, improve the initial conditions of the models. Right? Um, and so one group that is really spending, uh, make, leading efforts, you know, in, in that way or working hard on those kinds of efforts in the California Current um, is, uh, is um, this group that's in Santa Cruz. Um, and so there's an operational 9-kilometer um, ROMS NEMRO configuration there with biogeochemistry, and um, that work is being ported through Suncoos, and, uh, and so you can reach out to those PIs, uh, Chris Edwards and Jerome Victor, if you want some more information about that. Um, but initializing the model has been, in a recent paper by Frasner et al, showed that initializing the model with data and like using this data assimilation technique will only get you so far in terms of our predictive skill and time. Um, and so we really want to, we really need to continue to focus on getting a better understanding of the dynamics and the mechanisms that drive predictability on different time scales as well. So this paper showed that for surface carbon dioxide in, um, in global simulations, right, that, um, that the initialization of the biogeochemical state with these data simulation techniques did not significantly improve the, the interannual to decadal predictions, while it did help those that were short, shorter term than interannual. And so um, they are, um, you know, suggesting in that work that the physics is really important to get to get right. So we, we definitely need our physical oceanographers in this as well. Okay, so kind of just as a summary, um, the habitat, uh, you know, of the HABs as a decision point is really important to consider when developing these forecasts. There are a lot of capabilities and throughout the large marine ecosystems throughout the U.S. Um, already. And that um, that kind of longer term seasonal interannual decadal is the is the weakest still. There's the fewest opportunities there, although there's a, a lot of work going on trying to get those going. Um, I I would like to see our skill measures move beyond uh, simple comparisons to one variable um, to be more process oriented. And so I look forward to having those kinds of discussions. And I think that that could really be facilitated by co-located observations. Um, which biogeochemical bio Argo would certainly help. Um, model evaluations need to be publicly accessible in these forecast systems in order to build trust with the community and um, uncertainty measures. Um, we could consider historical skill there, and I think that's a research area. And a grand challenge that I'd like to kind of put forth is that um, is attribution of ocean role, the role of ocean acidification in harmful algal bloom generation, both in terms of the uh, event scale and the long-term trends. Something that these kind of models can be used to do, and so 
A hot off a of press example for that, it's from the UCLA group, Squirp, UW, PML collaborators. Um, so Faisal Kasari uh, is leading a, the paper on this. Um, Daniele Bianchi just shared me with me this slide this morning. <laughs> um, but what they've done is uh, they have attributed anthropogenically enhanced nutrients to the coastal ocean um, from the uh, from the land derived, right? Um, and the role of those in uh, corrosive or uh, exacerbating ocean acidification and hypoxia events in Southern California, um, and how that kind of could impact the suitable habitat for calcifiers and the vulnerability of the ecosystem. So that kind of attribution is something that these models can be used for. Um, so we'll return to that poll, and with that, I'll happy to take any questions. Oh, I guess we're waiting for questions, right? Thank you. <laughs> Until then, yeah. Thank you, Sam. So please, um, if you guys have any more um, uh, things you'd like to add to the poll, the poll is going to be open throughout. Um, right now, we're going to switch over to Clarissa Anderson. If you have any questions for Sam or any of our other speakers, please enter them in the chat box. Dr. Clarissa Anderson is a biological oceanographer with expertise in ecological forecasting and remote sensing. After receiving her bachelor's in biology and art history at UC Berkeley and marine science PhD at UC Santa Barbara, she completed several postdocs before transitioning into a position at UC Santa Cruz. The majority of her research has focused on the prediction of harmful algal blooms and toxins in estuarine and coastal ecosystems, as well as the fate and transport of harmful toxins to deeper waters and sediments. During her time as research faculty at UC Santa Cruz, she worked to establish the California Harmful Algae Risk Mapping, or CHARM, Sea Harm System. She's now at Scripps Institute of Oceanography, directing the Southern California Coastal Ocean Observing System, or SCU, and continuing to conduct research on phytoplankton ecology in coastal California. She um, would like to point out that she's indebted to some key mentors for and inspiration, namely Mark. Um, Brzezinski, and if I mispronounce that, I apologize, Dave Siegel, Rafa Cadella, and Claudia Benitez Nelson. And with that, Clarissa? <clears throat> Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, thanks, everybody. Uh, now that Sam's given us a really great overview of the opportunities, and the challenges that are facing OA, hypoxia, forecasting, and how those models could be used to help us understand the interactions with HABs. I'm going to drill down on the modeling and forecasting of harmful algal blooms with a focus on California. So uh, first off, this talk's motivated by fairly new funding from the NOAA IUS Coastal Ocean Modeling Testbed Program, a bit of a mouthful. We sometimes just call it COMT, to assess the utility of a model that um, is also a mouthful. It's called the West Coast Ocean Forecast System, or WCOFS. Um, its domain spans the entire west coast of the continental US. And we really just want to assess um, WCOFS relative to a suite of existing regional models that are hosted or served by various IUS regional associations on the west coast. And to the left here, you see the community of modelers and scientists on the west coast who are working to get these forecasts developed and disseminated. And then to the right is a handful of stakeholders from Washington to California who are part of an ongoing conversation about how, um, how we could make models useful to their needs, whether that's fisheries management, marine protected area management, marine mammal rescue, public health, et cetera. So if you're not familiar with the broad range of activities that the IUS regional associations, as we call them, um, engage in, and you can see them all here on the left, uh, this slide's meant to give you a high-level sense of the way in which we steward the entire life cycle of ocean observations and models to create a consistent national capability with the aim of serving the needs of a diverse group of local to regional and even state, um, even national stakeholders. And this is across many sectors. So Jan Newton at NANUS, Henry Rule at Sencoos, and then myself at SCOOS are collaborating on many pan-regional products, modeling endeavors, uh, visualization ideas and tools, because the California Current, as you know, is a continuous, connected, large marine ecosystem, um, much like what Sam just told us about, and it does not recognize state boundaries. And we need to consider that when we think about the modeling. 
Um, so the IUS Con T project that I mentioned in my introduction is one of these projects, and it's led by Chris Edwards from the UC Santa Cruz group, and is meant to evaluate how this new model, WCOFs, which is slated for operational rollout at NOAA sometime around February 2021, um, to really think about um, the fact that there are already a number of ecological forecasting models and products being hosted in some capacity by the West Coast RAs, the IUS Regional Associations, and they're already meeting certain end user needs. So it's important that we establish what the ramifications are, if any, that we might see should WCOFs be a supporting circulation model for HABs, ocean acidification, hypoxia, fisheries models, you name it, um, and possibly replacing other regional ROMs configurations. So it's important to also note that because WCOFs covers the entire West Coast domain, these pan-regional products are an obvious outcome. So to give a handle on this, Jan, Henry, Chris, and I led a workshop last September, uh, co-organized by regional stakeholders with the intent of assessing these user requirements across a whole lot of sectors, use cases from maritime transport to fish species conservation, OAH, HABs, and of course both of those latter two feed back on fisheries and transport. So the workshop was a real blend of, of technical experts such as Alex Karapov who leads WCOF's development uh, all the way to our stakeholder partners at Marathon Oil Corporation, fisheries managers from Washington, Oregon, and California, and aquaculture facility operators. The workshop resulted in a long list of requirements for various topics and use cases, and I've tried to distill a few here for each of those topics. So we covered physics, fish habitat, OAH, and HABs. And if you're interested in seeing that full spreadsheet that I reference here on the slide, just let me know, because right now I just want to dive into the requirements for HAB prediction for the remainder of this talk. So highlighted over here on the right, um, you can see that there were a number of things at a fairly high level that came, came, became important in this discussion. Um, and so I'm going to step through these, starting with um, how to improve forecast lead times and address movement of HABs across state boundaries, and then move to the food web interaction component and then nearshore impacts on aquaculture. So in terms of forecasting HABs, CHARM, which was just introduced, um, and it's already an existing operational model. Rafe mentioned it, too, in his talk last week. It's a spatially explicit prediction of the probability of demotic acid production by Pseudonychia species in California. So that's the diatom that causes us a lot of problems all along the West Coast. And we do this with one to three day lead times right now. So it's entirely run now by NOAA Coast Watch, and it's served on SCUS and SENQ sites. But it also uses Yichau's three-kilometer California Regional Ocean Model System, his ROMS configuration, that SCUS and SENQ support. Um, and it's, it's really the physical circulation backbone for CHARM. So most of our fisheries and shellfish monitoring program partners who were at that, that workshop, they agreed that three days is good, but two weeks would be even better. And right now, we're constrained by the skill of the ROMS model which is best in that three-day window, kind of the weather scales. And we're continuing to evaluate sea harm in a research context. Uh, we're doing that within the IUS Conti project, looking at the impacts of WCOFs. And since the, the WCOFs domain will be West Coast wide, as I said a minute ago, we're interested in getting to that interstate trajectory question that our stakeholders posed by expanding it north and even south to synergize with efforts in the Pacific Northwest. And so in that vein, uh, working with Dale Robinson and Chris Edwards, we're swapping Yeechow's California ROMs, here I refer to it as ROMs Classic, with WCOF's crops just for California, keeping all other components and inputs to see harm the same. So this way we can do, um, I guess you could call it a sensitivity analysis on the physical predictors like temperature and salinity that come from the circulation model. It's hard to know which is better. Um, you know, all models have issues, uh, but they're also all useful in a different way. So uh, we know there are biases in salinity for both versions of ROMs, and we need to be exploring this a little further. So more work is needed to, get, I think, get at, um, you know, if we can create a West Coast-wide demotic acid forecast that has good skill. And then that accuracy, and, and this came up in Sam's talk a bit, you know, is, is how, do we, how do we convey accuracy, uncertainty, et cetera, um, and in, in our way, we're assessing this through compilations of model output and monitoring data. And, it, and we're doing this in California with the California Hab Bulletin, which is this monthly public product pushed out by SCUS 
but it's a, it's a statewide collaboration with, with Sinkus, with all of our stakeholders at the state. And so the hope here is not only to produce the document with stakeholders on a monthly basis, but that they can then calibrate CHARM relative to their resource, time and spatial skills relevant to their management needs, um, and then maybe have a better way to understand uncertainty rather than a list of statistics that could be hard to interpret. And the Pacific Northwest Hab Bulletin that Jan will discuss in a bit rolls up a similar set of data and models to meet user needs in Washington and Oregon. So continuing on the food web theme and then connecting surface to benthic coupling, um, some new work led by Chris Free, who is at UC Santa Barbara right now, has focused on a statistical link between sea harm output of demoic acid probability in the water, of course, that's what that model tells us, but then trying to link that to the likelihood of contamination in benthic critters, like dungeness crab, rock crab, spiny lobster, even razor clams, and some other um, some other bivalves. And Rafe kind of got at this too last week, just that this is the difficulty. We really need to do this, take this to the next step with the food web. Um, and these are all key derby fisheries with really well-known demoic acid problems. So using machine learning models like random forests, Chris, I think, was quite successful in demonstrating good accuracy with these predictions and reconstructing hindcasts of contamination events in fishing grounds, as you can see here on the right in the Hoogmuller plots. Um, in this case, uh, contamination events are identified as events where more than 50% of the population is contaminated with DA above the action threshold. And then those horizontal black lines that you see there indicate latitudes with routine sampling programs, um, generally you know, conducted by the state, California Department of uh, fish and wildlife, et cetera. And the points are the location and timing of those historical sampling periods. And I would say the really important takeaway here for Dungeness crab is that the model predicts a number of late season contamination events that actually went undetected following the end of the pre or early season testing. And so even though the majority of the Dungeness crab catch is usually caught at the beginning of the season, this unmonitored late season catch still could lead to public health risk. And so ultimately what Chris was showing is that the use of predictive statistical models, which is you know, what a machine learning model is, could guide the dynamic management of DA and contamination, or at least the, the contamination from DA. And maybe we could think about the reduction um, in the burden that these closures to fisheries and aquaculture farms cost you know, over time. Um, and then the other interesting thing here for aquaculture species, so I didn't show you, I'm not showing you all the data here, but of course looking at various oysters and mussels as well, um, that those exhibited really low rates of DA contamination, um, didn't really go above that FDA action threshold. And so the models of contamination risk were generally unreliable or they just were impossible to estimate. And so the low rate of contamination when you're thinking about aquaculture species is can likely driven by really fast depuration rates and even the frequency of testing or how we employ dynamic management um, at these aquaculture farms in collaboration with our state public health departments. And I think that's a really important point. So getting to the last bullet that was in our, in our user list there, our user needs list, um, and thinking about near shore impacts, I want to highlight one last study that we conducted in Humboldt Bay in Northern California. Um, and so the Humboldt Coast has been really emerging as a hotspot for DA ever since the big marine heat wave of 2014-2016, the blob. Uh, and shellfish at these grow sites in northern Humboldt Bay are rarely toxic um, with demonic acid. I mean, they may have other toxins um, that I'm not addressing right now, but we wanted to know why and to see if we could really you know, think about extending our coastal predictions from sea harm of demonic acid into the bay. Um, rather than doing some fancy uh, you know, physical downscaling, we were going to then just employ an existing hydrological model for the bay, use the fact that they have a dye experiment already conducted, and then convert the sea harm probabilities that are along the coast, thinking of those as like a boundary condition, into DA concentration as a conservative dye tracer. And so that's what we did, and that's what you're seeing here in this time series plot. And then the results of the dive, and we also had a sister particle tracking experiment that I'm not showing you here. Um, and we did this along a gradient of sites in the bay that are shown on the map on the left. So you can see coming in from the coast and going up, up north into the bay. Um, that dissolved or particulate, depending on which experiment, uh, demoic acid tracer really does reach the northernmost shellfish growing sites. If you're just looking at physical impediments, they didn't seem to exist. Um, and that's shown here in the time series for each location in red, blue, green, black. So in essence, the shellfish beds in the North Bay 
can theoretically be exposed to high DA concentrations that originate on the shelf. And then given that we also observe very high DA concentrations in that part of the bay, and this is work that Rafe mentioned last week that we've been doing for a while in the bay, um, it remains a mystery as to why these beds up there rarely get closed. And maybe this comes back to Chris's work, Chris Free's work, is that one possibility is that there's high depuration rates, another is residence time of the water, um, and then there's also the fact that weekly sampling by the California Department of Public Health um, you know, might actually miss these ephemeral events. But the question I pose then is, does that matter for protecting public health when it comes to aquaculture? And so I'm going to end um, with some grand challenges. And I guess it's important for us to acknowledge that we're a long way from accurately predicting new shore risk to have toxins, as I was just going over. Um, I feel as though there's a lot more modeling and epidemiological work that we need to do in that regard. Um, and that's, this could come down to physical downscaling, um, understanding whether events just are ephemeral and, and that that's the issue. Um, and then seasonal forecasts. You know, this came up in Sam's talk. Seasonal forecast of HABs is also important to our stakeholders. Uh, this came up a lot in the workshop, both for pelagic fisheries and um, for aqu aquaculture. So I guess the component here that we need to ascertain is whether we, could, we need, you know, a better understanding of the internal variability in the system and see if we can identify the deterministic component of the nonlinear dynamics, since we know a lot of these plankton dynamics are fairly nonlinear. And then I'm going to just briefly point out that, um, you know, understanding how the offshore community is different from the nearshore community is another important challenge, at least for us in the, in the California current. And one of the ways we're starting to address this in California is with a new project to create a network of robotic microscopes. And so you probably all know about imaging flow cytobots designed by Heidi Sosick and Rob Olson at Huey. And recently, the California Ocean Protection Council has granted um, a large group of us in California Proposition 1 funds to purchase and then install six new IFCBs and join four other instruments to create a network of 10 automated microscopes. And we want to put these on offshore moorings and on piers. Uh, these will tell us generally in real time how the phytoplankton community is changing. And I think, importantly, this is this was not just going to provide us high-frequency observations of plankton across um, what we're hoping is this pretty nice cross-shore gradient if we have them on moorings, but that this is a large latitudinal range as well, and it's going to give us an opportunity to evaluate those changes over space and time in OAH dynamics and in conjunction with HAB dynamics. Because as Ray showed last week for one of the California automated shore stations where we have biological and chemical measurements co-located, the power of understanding the interactions there when you have <clears throat> those kinds of measurements co-located. And we can do this at a lot of our sites. So the last grand challenge I'll bring up is just predicting uh, the multi-stressor interactions. This is germane to this workshop, um, and we really need to dig into this more. This has come up now. This particular mod modeling framework has come up in a couple of talks. A uh, very important tool, I think, for testing these interactions to use physical biological coupled models like the Romsbeck model framework that Sam showed in her last slide. It's being funded by EcoHab, and this particular study anyway, there's a lot of leveraged investment that I list here. Um, it builds on that kind of work. Packard Sea Grant, OPC, and NOAA have all invested in various components of this modeling framework that we're using in the past, including the zero-D demoic acid model for mechanist mechanistic modeling that we're doing for demoic acid. And so I think this is ideally suited to interrogate the intersection there of OA, hypoxia, and HABs, and then even, of course, evaluate the food web impacts. And that's the, the beauty of using a um, you know, multi-state variable ecosystem model. And then the project on the right is just getting going. And this one's going to examine the regulation of demoic acid genes in relation to nutrients and physics, since um, this group that, that I'm working with here has um, isolated the genetic basis for demoic acid production. And so this will all be done in situ, and it will help parameterize and validate the Romsbeck model to the left. And then we hope get better, more accurate predictions of HABs. And then that will get you to better evaluating those multi-stressor impacts and addressing one of the questions that I saw from the poll, um, which is you know, getting at interactions between OA and other variables like silicic acid, phosphate, and then light and temperature, and looking at all of that together. And so I'll end there, and thank you for this opportunity, thank, and thanking my sponsors and funders. Um, and now I'm going to shift into Jan's talk on the same slide deck. So Jan. Thank you, Clarissa. So our next speaker, as Clarissa mentioned, is Dr. Jan Newton. She's a senior principal oceanographer 
with the Applied Physics Lab at University of Washington and an affiliate professor at both the UW School of Oceanography and the School of Marine and Environmental Affairs. Jan serves as the Executive Director of the Northwest Association of Networked Ocean Observing Systems, or NAMI, and she's also the co-director of Washington OA Center, which operates from the College of the Environment and Earth Lab and fosters connections among researchers, policymakers, industry, and others to address key priorities established by state legislature concerning ocean acidification. Jan's expertise is biological oceanography, and her work focuses on physical, chemical, and biological dynamics of Puget Sound and coastal Washington, including understanding the effects of climate and humans on water properties. She's applying that research on local scales to a global network, um, on local scales and to the global network, the Global Ocean Acidification Observing Network, which she is a co-chair of. And with that, I will let Jan. Thank you so much, Erica. And, um, Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be part of this series. You heard some great things from um, Sam on the ocean acidification modeling and from Clarissa on um, both OAH and HABs in, um, in pan-regional scales. What's going to happen now is both Barb and myself are going to drill down on HABs in our region. We're both um, along with Clarissa, all three of us are directors of regional associations. And what's so great about that construct is that you have the ability to really understand what is important for that region and try to make the connections with the observations, the modeling, the forecast. So I'm here in the Pacific Northwest talking to you about HABs. And these four pictures really underscore the four words there, health, economy, ecology, and culture. And HABs are so important here in the Pacific Northwest for each of those four. Next slide. Thank you, Clarissa, for advancing my slides. So here just underscores that, that title. And you see um, the crab landings when we had the very large Pseudonyptia bloom. And you see the loss, $100 million loss in 2015. Um, the harvest of shellfish is for tribe, for sustenance, for commercial, which is certainly the economy, and the economy jobs in rural locations, not just, you know, urban um, economies, and recreational, which recreational is peace of mind, but also that's tourism and, again, supporting the economy in, in those locations. Tribes have depended on um, seafood since time immemorial. It's part of their culture, it's part of their sustenance, and it's part of their treaty rights. Um, and then you also see the effect on the ecology when we had the shellfish closures due to Pseudonyxia large scale bloom. You saw mammal deaths and other impacts. So it's a big deal, and we need to get a better handle on it. So next slide. Okay, so um, what is so fortunate is that we have a history of oceanographic observations off of the coast. Um, Barbara Hickey was key to many of this, of this research, much of this research. And she, her colleagues, Vera Trainer, others, um, found that there are HAB generation sites, those little yellow circles. One's known as the Juan de Fuca Eddy, the other is a heck of a bank. And there's cool oceanography going on there, but I'm not going to talk about that. But those are generation sites for the harmful algal bloom cells, like Pseudonyxia. Um, but it's not just those. It's also how that gets distributed. And that depends on the wind direction, not only in the um, sense of, of the, um, the wind direction and the wind stress, but also how that um, leads to either up or down welling. And then the third thing that was really important was the Columbia River plume. The Columbia River is a major river um, on the west coast of North America, and its plume is quite large. It can either be a barrier or a conduit for the cells reaching the beach. But understanding these basic oceanographic principles led to the ability to make forecasts. So next slide. So what um, Vera Trainer and many others um, from 
um, organizations like ORHAB and um, um, other entities have worked on is a Pacific Northwest Harmful Algal Bloom Bulletin. And so this bulletin is really bringing together all sorts of those data um, that give indications on what's going on. The toxin and cell monitoring at the coast that's done by the state and tribes in both Washington and Oregon, offshore boat sampling sites at hot spots, the weather, and then models that can tell us things about cell transport and the plume, climate change indicators. And this kind of information has been so important because it allows managers from both the state agencies and the tribes, shellfish are co-managed in, in um, the Pacific Northwest, it allows them to do selective harvest at safe locations to understand where those locations might be, to do preemptive changes and harvest limited, limits, and um, have better information on the risk. So next slide. Sorry for the lag. Um, the thing about this bulletin is that it's been dynamic. It has been co-designed with the managers. And so here you see some of the feedback that they gave. You know, we need more explanations. Um, we want these traffic light graphics up front. And you can see there the red, yellow, green. It's the have risk of overall. And, um, and, a, and a summary that, that now is there in the gray box. And so it's been great to see this community coming together um, since 2007. And so that's long term, and there's a lot of trust and a lot of understanding how the scientists are trying to support the managers and how the managers can give insight to the scientists on, on their needs. But it's also been great on pulling in new things like the live ocean model that has been mentioned, um, like the ESP. And so here is a slide on the live ocean model. Parker McCready leads this and has worked with Sam and others over, um, over time. And so here you see all of the um, forcings from WARF, HICOM, USGS, et cetera, um, comes into a ROMS-based model. And then you can visualize it on our NANUS visualization system. And as was said earlier, by clicking on the model as well as a buoy icon, you can see um, the comparison. And so if you can start this video, Marissa. Um, the application to stakeholders here is, is um, I guess you can't really see the animation so well, but um, um, you can put particles at those HAB generation sites and then let the model run with the forcing of the day and, show, and see whether they reach the beach or not. And so this has been a real key aspect of the Pacific Northwest HAB bulletin. So next slide. This is the skill assessment, and, and it's a little complicated, but the graphic on the um, right and the bottom with those rust-colored lines, that starts from either um, the yellow dot there, the Juan de Fuca Eddy or Hecuda Bank, and then it's showing the tracking of particles hitting Long Beach. Long Beach is on the, um, just outside of Willapa Bay, and, um, and so that's a really important um, area. And so you can see the transport from those generation sites, either from the north or from the south. And you can see what the model um, predicted in terms of particle tracking. Then the green um, plot in the middle shows you the counts. Ooh, can you go back? <laughs> the counts of the um, actual Pseudonycia cells. And you can see that. For instance, the um, Juan de Fuca Eddy, the, um, the transport in September of 05, really matched when they saw the cells on the beach. But it didn't so much in April and June. But then if you look at from Hecata Bank to Long Beach, that really um, overlaps well. So it's so important to have this both the sophisticated oceanographic knowledge and these tools like the live ocean model, as well as the um, the sampling on the beach, and all of this together can be extremely powerful. Next slide. Another important tool in our toolbox has been the environmental sample processor. Stephanie Moore at um, Northwest Fisheries Science Center is a wizard with this. 
basically a robot under the sea that tells you things like harmful algae and toxins, can tell you the demolic acid concentration, and then working with John Mickett from the University of Washington has been able to put this out near the Juan de Fuca eddy, between the eddy and the beach, and it acts as a sentinel. And the data are relayed in real time to shore, and you can actually look at that from NANUS, from the NVS, and see the concentration um, for the periods that that sentinel is out there. Next slide. So the ESP has been a really valuable addition to the Pacific Northwest HAB Bulletin. So here you kind of see the, the current day um, um, compilations of, of all the things that are there. And we're really taking advantage of new technologies as well as old technologies and these trusted relationships. So next slide. There's a cute picture of stuff. <laughs> Um, here is the, um, the Pacific Northwest HAB Bulletin um, as it is presented on the NANUS website. We have been working through IUS to transition this, this bulletin in a sustained way. And um, as said, since the regional associations are certified um, as regional information coordination entities, this, this um, is really a good role for us, but also you know, we're partners with these, these trusted um, scientists, managers, et cetera, together. Next slide. And here's the payoff. These are quotes um, from a um, fisheries manager in Washington State, Dan Ayers, and the same for the Quinault Indian Nation, Joe Schumacher. And reading these quotes just gives you the sense of how important this information is. These are um, quotes that were more focused on the ESP because they came to me. <laughs> but I know that every time the bulletin is, is posted, because I'm on their mailing list, I see the quotes coming back from the managers. And, and I think that this is just so important, and I want to underscore what, what those people are saying. So um, the last thing I want to leave you with is, is really understanding HABs in a multi-stressor world. So um, researchers have been seeing for a while, noting the connection between when shellfish closures happen and when we have warmer than average waters. So, and the beginning of this analysis was really focused on El Nino Southern Oscillation, or the PDO, and seeing those correlations. You can see the red all kind of going in synchrony there. And then we had the marine heat wave known as the blob, um, and we had this this enormous bloom that stretched from Alaska to, to Baja, and um, the observation that the toxins are there. So this kind of deep knowledge that we have um, will help guide our research in the future. And, um, and how that is affected by ocean acidification is also really important. So my last two slides, key messages, tailored forecasts enable effective management actions. Model skill is assessed to use mooring and monitoring data, and that short-term bloom conditions can inform long-term projections. So those are things coming out of that. And so last slide, these are my grand challenges and research needs. And um, I think one of the grand challenges is, is to sustain the real um, incredible skill that we have. You know. Um, in the Pacific Northwest, we're doing this. You've seen other examples. You're going to see one more. And to be able to sustain that. And I think with that, we need more wide um, demonstration of the efficacy to managers and the public health and economy, and to more widely articulate that this matters to coastal pride cultures and sustainability, and that those two things are really important. So some of that is more in terms of making people understand the importance of this. The last one that I have here is the scientific research need, which is to understand better the ocean acidification on algal bloom linkage. I think that's all what we're interested in. That's why we're part of this webinar and workshop. Um, but to do that in context with other stressors, such as temperature and hypoxia. Um, so with that, I'm going to say thank you and hand the baton to Barb.
Thank you so much, Jan. And as Jan mentioned, our next speaker is Dr. Barbara Kirkpatrick, who is the Executive Director for the Gulf of Mexico Coastal Ocean Observing System, or G2. She has more than 35 years of experience in human and environmental epidemiology, very relevant right now, and started her career as a respiratory care supervisor at Duke University Medical Center before going on to receive a master's in health occupations ed at Northern at North Carolina State University and a PhD in educational leadership from the University of Sarasota. Her research focus is on harmful algal blooms and the effects they have on humans. She was a co-chair of the National Harmful Algal Bloom Steering Committee for six years and co-chaired the National Harmful Algal Bloom Science Meeting in 2013. As executive director of g she has been instrumental in broadening the scope of the Ocean Monitoring Organization to include biological aspects of ocean monitoring, particularly monitoring for toxic algal blooms and marine animal movements. Barb? So, thank you. Um, where everyone can hear me? We're good? Okay. So, we're going to, thanks to the organizers, and we're going to switch coasts very quickly now um, to the Gulf of Mexico. And we're going to, I'm going to briefly talk about the next generation of HAB forecasting in the Gulf of Mexico, um, which we like to call version 2.0. And as you can see, like many things with HABs and OAs, it takes a village. And I'll talk a little bit about the partners, but you can see the logos there um, on the screen. Oops. Okay, so you might ask yourself, so why do we need an improved forecast? Um, the toxic aerosols from Corinia brevis uh, in the Gulf of Mexico cause uh, uh, severe burning of the eyes and lungs when people inhale those toxins. Uh, more importantly, people who have asthma um, and inhale these toxins, it takes up to five days to recover from just a one-hour walk on the beach during red tide. In addition, we see a 54% increase in emergency room visits for um, upper respiratory uh, illness. And as you know, the beaches are huge economic drivers, particularly in Florida and Texas, where Corinia brevis blooms are most common. and um, this is critical to our economy. So it's real important to inform people of the respiratory risk, keep them healthy, but also let them know when our beaches are uh, available for um, visits. Oops, see I keep, I feel like I've had too much coffee. Okay, so why we need an improved forecast. We've had a, a forecast in the Gulf of Mexico since 2004, um, but we need increased sampling at the beaches with real near-time results. These blooms are very patchy, as you can see from the satellite imagery on the right, and uh, impacts shift from day to day. Actually, sometimes they shift within the, the same day. Um, we're getting better satellite imagery in the nearshore environment, and that's really under the purview of my co-investigator, Rick Stumpf, that I think many of you know. And we need to improve the respiratory forecast model to a, a increased spatial and temporal scale. So, we, need, we addressed that we are acknowledged that we needed to increase sampling, um, and we created what we call HABScope. And this is HABS, oh, I can do the arrow thing here. This is HABScope. Um, it is a off-the-shelf microscope, about $250 microscope. It has a 3D printer printed adapter over the ocular, and then this is an iPod. So instead of doing highly skilled microscopic counts that have been the traditional way of reporting Karenia, we now have citizen scientists who during a bloom 
take a short video of a water sample. And this is a little messed up. I apologize, but it just shows the upload screen on the iPod where they upload the video to GQs. And then we have image recognition software that has been developed by a very talented product developer, Bob Courier at GQs, um, that does an automatic cell count. And if we could uh, show the video now, please. OK, so this video, we have the advantage that Corinia Brevis has some unique swimming features. And so this video is showing that the image recognition software recognizes a cell, identifies it in the green box as a Corinia Brevis cell. You notice it then turns red. That's just to make sure that we don't double count the same cell. And again, up here, we get, in about uh, 20 seconds time, a calculated cell count. And again, in Sam's opening comments, her comment was, when is good enough good enough? And in this case, when we're trying to predict respiratory irritation from the aerosols, we don't need the fine scale uh, analysis that you need during uh, for shellfish closers, for example. OK, if we can go back to the PowerPoint. Thank you. So um, what that means, again, we have citizen scientists sampling the beaches. We get high definition wind speed from the National Weather Service. And then again, we have the software developed from GQs to do an automatic cell count. Um, we are able then to put out predictions at three-hour intervals up to a 24-hour interval after a cell count has been determined. And I'll show you an example. I know that one might be a little small in a minute. And then, of course, we have Rick Shop provides high-resolution satellite imagery. So we've had some very early successes in both Pinellas County, which is St. Petersburg, Florida, and Lee County, which is down in the Sanibel Fort Myers area. And we were able to, as a demonstration, deliver respiratory risk forecast daily to over 300, res three, I'm sorry, 3,000 residents. So here's a little closer look at it. And um, again, this example is pretty evident of how patchy these blooms are. But this is the peninsula up here. This is the peninsula of St. Petersburg. And these are all the beaches. And you can see that at 4 in the afternoon on that day, it wasn't a very good day to go to the beach. Um, but by 10 o'clock at night, winds had probably shifted, would be my guess. And you can see that if you're an asthmatic, there were several beaches that you can go to and take your walk or run on the beach in the evening. And then there were some that were OK, but you notice that were, there were none that were red or should be avoided. So again, these sorts of efforts take multiple partners. And we're partnered, of course, with NOAA and um, NCOS in particular, um, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Research Institute in St. Pete. We've had support from Pinellas County Environmental Monitoring. I am part of Texas A&M Oceanography Department. We also have University of Texas engaged, Moat Marine Laboratory in Sarasota, Lee County, which is the Fort Myers, and Collier County, which is the Naples area government. So we've gotten uh, a amazing buy-in from local uh, government agencies. And for those of you who may be aware in Florida, um, traditionally, red tide has been a very hard thing for both tourism and um, 
the local government to partner with us. And so we're really thrilled that they see this as a valued product and are supporting it. Uh, okay, so our goal is to forecast as many beaches as we can every day in the Gulf of Mexico when we have these Corinia brevis blooms. And um, we hope to expand the number of citizen scientists with HABSCOPES helping us provide the spatial and temporal resolution that we need for more impactful forecasts. Where else we're going with it is we hope to, to take the image recognition software uh, to other areas and other species that you can see on the screen and, and see if we can take uh, this new kind of monitoring uh, to different areas. And so I'll close with just a few comments. Uh, a few of them have been made by my colleagues already about the grand challenges. Um, I think using uh, new ways to monitor uh, and using artificial intelligence or Im image recognition software is going to be a powerful tool with harmful algal bloom monitoring. And again, referring to Sam's comment in the beginning that we need to look hard at scienti as scientists that scientifically we always want that that most accurate observation we can get. But to serve our stakeholders and our communities, is there something that gets to that level of reporting that isn't at the shellfish regulation um, level, but is extremely useful to people? I think we, as a Karenia brevis scientist, we need much more understanding of how uh, uh, OA affects toxicity of HABs. And finally, I just have to put a plug in my, again, my data manager or product developer, Bob Courier, always likes to say we need things that are user friendly to our stakeholders that we're trying to reach. And in particular, he always says we need things that are platform agnostic. And what he means is whether you're on a desktop, you're on a tablet, you're on an iPhone, you're on an Android-based, they can reach our products and, and interpret them easily regardless of what uh, piece of technology the, they're holding in their hand. And with that, I thank you for your time, and I'll turn it over back over to the organizers. Thank you so much, Barb. And I want to say thank you to all of our speakers and remind everyone that in the chat box right now, the last chat includes a link to a Google form that has a questionnaire that we're using to inform our future um, research priorities for harmful algal blooms and ocean acidification. And the questionnaire is specific to this talk and our four speakers that we just heard. So if everyone could please just take five minutes and click on that link and answer the questions in there. That would really help us and would also help Maya um, for her summer project with us. Um, and after you all do that, then we're going to begin our discussion with our speakers. So we'll open the floor up for questions. If you have any questions, please chat them in the box. And um, if it's for a specific speaker, please um, write the name of the speaker in the box, and Maya will be turning it over to you to um, read the question. Thank you. Uh, we have our first question from Beth Turner for Clarissa. She stated, you mentioned that HAB stakeholders wanted two-week forecasts. Are OEH stakeholders interested in the same time frame? Hey, yeah, thanks, Beth. That's a good question. Um, what we found for the most part when it came to which the group that was mostly fisheries managers and usually kind of more offshore pelagic fisheries, um, those were the stakeholders who were thinking a lot about OAH, not that it's not impacting like nearshore um, you know, calcifiers, 
but we were hearing a lot from that particular community in this context of modeling, and they were saying that it really is better to go back to these coupled models where you can interrogate process in a kind of a hindcast mode and look at these hindcast reanalyses and, and, and try to understand process and think about how that's going to influence things. And then they wanted longer term, more like projections of where things are headed in the ecosystem. And when it comes to shellfish growers, you know, we work with, with that community more on a real-time basis, and I feel as though because the models don't tend to get into those really small scales yet very well, um, for the, the shellfish growers, it comes down more to um, putting instruments in that can look at pH and oxygen and other parameters in real time. And we, didn't, we all didn't have a chance to get into that work we're doing on that today, but that's probably where it would break down in terms of models versus observations um, from the people we spoke to. Thank you. I hope that answers your question, Beth. And we have another one from Beth Turner, and this one is for Barb. She asked, are there aquaculture facilities near where the forecasts are happening? And good question. And yes, there are. Um, they're more in the estuary, so Tampa Bay, which of course is co-located next to St. Petersburg. Um, Charlotte Harbor down near Fort Myers. Um, there are aquaculture facilities both more on the estuary or bay side than in the open ocean side. Thank you. Um, at the moment, I don't see any questions coming in. All right, so we're going to now look at our polls that we asked everyone to review. So this is the poll that we started at the beginning. Um, and the question was, what do you want or need in order to adequately stimulate interactions between ocean acidification and the HAB? And here is what we got. So I don't know, speakers, do you guys want to respond to any of these answers that have been posed? Maybe we can take it one at a time. Um, maybe sure, can you hear me okay? Yeah, so um, I, this seems to be a bit of a, um, a bit of a theme there in some of those answers. Everyone can see those, correct? Yeah. Um, I think that, you know, yeah, that kind of um, attribution of, of the role of OA, right, within that and understanding from a mechanistic point of view where that, what that's, what's happening there, um, I think is particularly interesting and, and it looks like the audience thinks so as well. Clarissa, would you like to respond or come on? Sorry, I was just going to add to that, to what Sam said. And I'm thinking about some of these questions that try to get into the uptake of carbon in the system. And, you know, I think we know that different plankton use different species of carbon, and sometimes a, there's much more of a preference for bicarbonate. And so as um, ocean acidification shifts the, you know, relative concentration of those carbonate species around, you see shifts in the phytoplankton community. And so it's not always a really straightforward answer in terms of what is um, carbon uptake due to that competitive uh, sort of um, interaction and then to the chemical environment surrounding those plankton. Um, and then there can just be the, the, the straightforward effects of pH on something like uh, the ability of, of a given plankton to produce toxin. So there's a lot of different interactions, and I think that's why we stress the importance of creating these accurate uh, coupled models where we can then isolate these um, consecutively and start looking at how each one of those affects the ultimate outcome um, of, a, of a competitive situation or toxin production. Thank you, Clara. Jan, do you have any um, comments? Yeah, I'm not sure that I have too much to add. I think that um, Sam and Clarissa made some really good points, and, and I agree that these sticks are, are um, kind of in the same vein and um, really getting at understanding the complexity of these interactions and doing that in a variety of ways. Um, I guess what I want to do, um, since I have the floor, is to 
thank you um, to the organizers for really putting this together. I think sometimes people stay in the stovepipes of their research, and sometimes when you try to break out of that, it's difficult. And we heard some of that in, in some other workshops. Um, I know the um, NOAA OAP one in Miami that was brought up. So I'm really happy to see this um, bringing together of the HAB and OA communities. I think our research informs each other, and I think some of the things that are listed here are, are really critical. And um, and I think you know there's one here that talks about policy, and I think that's just so um, such an important thing to to drill on the um, the importance of this, so that so that there is uh, the ability to to sustain things, to fund research on understanding these complexities more. Okay, so thank you, organizers. Yeah. And Barb, did you want to offer any comments or thoughts on this? are not hearing you with your All right, we might have lost Barb um, while we wait for her to adjust her mic. We do, it does look like we have another question. Yes. The next question is from Beth Turner. It's for all the speakers. She asks, do you think that OAH and HAB stakeholders are different enough to need separate forecasts, or would a coupled forecast work for both audiences? And this is for all I think that a coupled forecast, personally, would be something that um, would work uh, for both audiences. And in some cases, um, there's a long-standing, like there, some forecasts ex have existed in the region and you know for a while, but used for different efforts. And you know those, um, you know if those groups were interested in doing ocean acidification forecasts and had you know already in, engaged with stakeholders, I would think that that might help them to engage with others, right? Um, that's not to say that new forecasts should be shunned, right? <laughs> but just to say that, you know, it seems like existing forecasts, the paths of trust that have already been kind of carved out could be, um, could be helpful in this situation. And, and since there are, you know, more um, forecasts of other types, ocean forecasts of other types, um, you know, than, than the ocean acidification ones, I think, you know, kind of partnering in those scenarios would be a benefit, you know. Um, but yeah, happy to hear what others think. Yeah, I'll, I'll yeah I think... Yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Chris. We'll go in order. <laughs> yeah, no, I was just going to add to what Sam said very briefly and say I think a diversity of approaches is important um, to the extent that there are existing models, some of which have more of a statistical basis. Um, and maybe only predict one or two or three parameters, that, that there's no reason to think you should abandon those, but that you should always be forward thinking about the way that we isolate process in our more complex models that can capture those interactions and, cre and create these, these combined forecasts. And I think both will ultimately be important, and the comparison of all of those approaches will ultimately be important. Yeah, well said, Clarissa. Um, I mean, to my mind, the reason to have an integrated forecast is because it, it helps us get the, the, the science um, perhaps a little bit better understood um, because they are integrated in nature, right? But if you have, as Clarissa said, you have a statistical model that is working well for a given stressor, um, then there's no need to abandon that. And, and this question asks about the stakeholders, and some are interested in both. Some aren't, so there's no one size fits all. For instance, if you know a shellfish grower is definitely going to be interested in, in harmful algal blooms as well as the OA in the water that may affect the, the um, settling of, of larvae. So in that case, absolutely, an integrated forecast would be great. 
but a public health official who's trying to figure out are there toxins on the beach and should I shut that beach down, they probably don't need OA, but if the OA in the model gives them a better model because that's something that's stimulating the toxin production, then yes. So I think it, it's a more complicated question um, than just thinking about is it one way or the other. I think um, there's, there's, need, there's need to understand the synergies between the two scientifically and then to understand our stakeholders. And in some cases, they need both. In some cases, they need one or the other. Yeah, and this is Barb. I'll just add that, um, you know, I think working together just makes sense in helping each other on a sort of lessons learned and, again, building that trust amongst communities. And I think if we work together, we can facilitate that on both sides. All right, thank you very much. Um, if anyone has any more questions, feel free to add, the, add them in the chat box now. Um, but if not, uh, I want to say thank you again to our speakers, to Jen, who is entering very valuable information in our chat box right now. We'll be posting a recording and a PDF of all the slides on our workshop webpage. And the questionnaire will be available there as well. Our next webinar coming up um, is going to be on July 8th at 1 p.m. And that will be um, doc, uh, Dr. Beth Stoffer, who's going to be talking about Gulf of Mexico and OA and HADS in the Gulf of Mexico. So um, I would like to thank everyone for your participation. And um, if you have any questions or comments, go ahead and enter them in the chat box. Thank you.